When you are starting the process of designing a research process, a lot of what you have to do is figure out how you're actually going to do it, right? We have all of these highfalutin fancy terms about the concepts and about the logical structures you use, and this week's lectures are really going to be heavy on those, but fundamentally, a lot of what you have to do is make an actual plan, right? It's very practical at some basic level. And so a good way to describe this process is to think about research design as logic plus logistics, right? The logic here is how you're going to get an answer to your research question. It's why the research question has to kind of be pretty well defined before you can actually build a project around it. And then the next thing you need to know is, is what logistically are you going to have to do to get there? The big thing to point out here, right, is that paradigms are going to differ in terms of the logic of the questions they ask, right? And they're going to pick different methods, maybe, um, and they certainly have different methodologies in that they'll have a different explanation for why the method they're using is correct. But the logistical angles of this really cross uh, paradigmatic lines. If I, as an interpretivist, am talking about how to run a project and my friend, a positivist, is talking about how to run their project, we'll often have more in common with each other as we're talking about the planning than uh, if we're do using similar methods, right? Because this part, it's the logic that is really dependent on your paradigm, not the logistic aspect. So just to review logics, which I talked about in a previous lecture, right? If you're dealing with an empirical situation you want to understand better and you want the best explanation of that situation possible, right? Then um, you're gonna follow an abductive logic, right? And this is most commonly used by interpretivists and sometimes realists. If you have a set of situations you wanna understand and you've got a general goal in mind, like a general point about how the world works, then you're gonna proceed inductively. Right, And that's used by both realist and positivist research. And then if you've got a theory or a hypothesis that comes from the literature, from prior research about what might be going on, and you want to figure out if that hunch is right, then you're going to follow a deductive logic. And this is what's used in positive re positivist research. And, um, and quantitative positivist research really does run on the basis of deductive question asking. And so when you're figuring out these dimensions, the first thing you really need to work through is determining what's your case. Now, there are two different definitions of the word case, and we'll use both of them in these conversations, but uh, they're, they're, they mean they're, they've are they they mean got a slight difference. The first is when you hear someone talk about a small n or a large n case study. Well, in that case, n is the number of observations, usually, and so, an N can be a whole country. So for instance, um, there's a classic work in comparative politics, Theta Scotchpole's States and Social Revolutions, and she's got an N of three in that her three cases are the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the Chinese Revolution, right? Those, those, that's an N of three. But similarly, if you're conducting a study on voting in the 2021 federal election in Canada, you can say you have an N of 6,000, and that doesn't mean you're looking at 6,000 different versions of uh, the 2021 election. It's that you're looking at the vote of 60 of, of 6,000 different voters, right? So that's the N. Those are observations. Um, generally, if you're looking at, you have to be able to specify what your case is. Right. If you're looking qualitatively, normally you have a smaller number of cases, but you you have much more information about each one. If you're working uh, qualitatively, normally you have a larger number of cases and less information about each one. Right. Less detail. Um, and then when you're picking your case, right, you need to make some choices about how you're going to get the number of cases. Right. So in the example I gave you of states and social revolutions, um, that's a technique called purposive sampling where Theta Scotchpole was like, okay, 
I want to study revolutions. What are the most important social revolutions in history that I can get enough information about? I'll compare those and then I'll use that to design a generalizable theory. She's proceeding inductively, right? Um, and that's called purposive sampling. She went and picked the cases that would help her understand the phenomenon, right? Um, random sampling is what happened to get that um, polling result data for the imaginary project on the 2021 election, right? Um, because if you're going to be looking at that many people, you have to make sure you've got a amount that really represents the population and random sampling is good for that. Um, you need to make sure that there are both differences and similarities in all of your cases. And you also sometimes pick a case based on how important it is. Let's never forget uh, Shapiro's emphasis that we should be doing problem-driven political science. It's worth making sure before you go to talk about a case that it's actually got something interesting in it that makes it worthwhile for you to talk about.